What's up all you Minties, this is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition, and join me today for an advanced look at these collected editions coming out from Marvel Comics this week, so please stay tuned. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these collected editions. All these books are due out in the direct market on July 7th, and then a couple of weeks later in the book market. Now, if you don't want any spoilers, or if you don't want to know anything about any of these stories, you can skip around. Uh, in the description of the video, I have the timestamps where I start talking about each of these books. And I normally don't talk about spoilers unless I tell you ahead of time, like it's going to be just a little bit of one. I, I think you're safe for this particular episode. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about Black Panther by ta Coates. All right, we have Black Panther. This is actually volume nine of this particular run on Black Panther. It's by ta Coates. And this... Speaking of ta Coates, is the grand finale of his story arc. This is the last volume uh, that he's written for Black Panthers. This collects the final issues that he wrote. That is issues 19 through 25. So, it is the Intergalactic Empire of Wakanda Part 4. And this uh, <laughs> it's going to be a little hard to talk about if you don't know what happened. I did an overview of the Intergalactic Empire of Wakanda, where they take Black Panther out of his element and throw him up into outer space and he's forgotten who he was and now this intergalactic war that's happening outside of Earth is coming to Earth. So you have Endajaka and all his army coming here for Earth and Wakanda has to stand up against them and they have to unite with other superheroes around the world. On top of that, Black Panther's kind of MIA, so who's going to take the role of Black Panther? And by Black Panther, I mean T'Challa. Because there always has to be a Black Panther. The goddess will not let that go away. So, somebody else might have to take the role of Black Panther to fight against this empire that's coming here to Earth. And what's really cool about this is that the way that the art flows, so you have Danielle Acuna, in who I could have sworn was Kev Walker. I don't know why I thought it was him, but it's not. It's actually Ryan Bodenheim. It's the artist that does most of the artwork that Daniel Acuna doesn't. So Daniel Acuna's part has this almost mystical look to it because he does a lot of paintings. Uh, whereas the other artwork in, throughout the book is just traditional comic book art. Now, I'm not going to say much of anything else about the book. Uh, we'll look at the extras, but that's all I can really say about it without giving anything away because we are talking about the grand finale of this run. So let's look at the extras. And I'm sure you probably noticed when I was flipping through here, the very first issue, that in the on the opposite page they have some of the variant covers. And here's the main cover. That is a badass cover right there. And here's a bunch of other variant covers all the way in the back. Uh, there are some other ones, but some of them are kind of spoilerish, and these are the least spoilerish. Let's go back over here. Uh, the book, by the way, has 176 pages and retails for $19.99. Again, collecting issues 19 through 25 of Black Panther. And of course, that is the 2018 series of Black Panther that Ta-Nehisi Coates started. Next up is The King in Black Atlantis Attacks. I never thought we'd get that title on a marvel book again atlantis attacks but here we are so this is a pretty interesting series because this is just a continuation of the new agents of atlas by greg pack that's what this pretty much is um because he's been telling this ongoing story since the war of the realms uh, when jimmy Wu first formed a new team of agents of atlas but i think this by far is my favorite one and I'm going to talk a little bit about why uh, here in a second. It's not. It's really not much of a spoiler, but if anything, it should get people excited for the fans of the original Jeff Parker's Agents of Atlas. So we have this big war coming from Atlantis. So Atlantis is attacking, hence the title. And honestly, this one has very little to do with the King in Black until the very end. And then you see where they're going to go with that, because this continues into Kurt Busiek's Namor king and black series so the story does not end here so here we have all the new agents of atlas amadeus cho silk all these characters and then we have the return of the classic agents of atlas with jimmy woo here like venus uh namora gorilla man 
the Uranian uh, 3D Man and M11. So, yes, this is awesome. And I love the way that they have kept uh, Namor's look. Big fan of this particular look. It's a mix between that Jay Lee, John Byrne style. I dig it. So, here we have, yeah, the introduction or the meaning of the classic Agents of Atlas with the new Agents of Atlas. And there's a lot of characters in this book, but you know, they're going to need help because they are fighting Namor and all of the Atlanteans. Now, um, like I said, this five-issue miniseries, it's only five issues, it's all collected in here, does lead into another miniseries, and that is the Namor miniseries. Uh, the book retails for $15.99 and has 112 pages. And, and yes, it is pretty interesting because you have the character of Wave, who's kind of caught in the middle of all of this. So who she ends up siding with is one of the biggest things throughout this little mini series. Now, as far as the extras in the back, that is a beautiful picture of Namora and is that, uh, Luna Snow, I think. It would have to be. That is by Yi Yoon Lee. Man. Oh, you have a Bill Everett classic cover, Ron Lim, Gerardo Sandoval. That's nice. And then you have some more variants back here. And of course, where else you can find the story of the Kingdom Black, including the Namor story by Kurt Busiek, where this particular story continues. And of course, all of it continues in the King in Black miniseries. But yeah, this is just Namor coming here to the surface because he wants the sacred dragon uh, weapon that somebody has stolen. Of course, there's always misunderstandings when, when it comes to Namor and all the Atlanteans. Now, another series, but one that I don't hear hardly anyone talk about, and because I think it's really underrated, and that is Peter David's Symbiote Spider-Man. This is kind of done in the way that the Agents of Atlas rolling into Atlantis' attacks is being done. Instead of doing an ongoing series, this is all collected through a series of mini-series, and there have been two in the past. So, if you've not read these books right here, oh my gosh, they're so good. So, this is Peter David going back in time, not physically like he just goes back and tells stories of peter parker during his years of the black alien costumes uh era and he is joined by greg land so you do have his artwork in here and if that bothers you well maybe overlook it because the damn story is so good it's worth it especially if you're a fan of this era or if you know even if you don't know much about it peter david just makes you think like oh man yeah absolutely all of this makes sense so this is the latest one. So this is the third miniseries. So this collects the King in Black Symbiote Spider-Man 1 through 5. And it has 128 pages here. So we're going to be looking at it just a little bit. Uh, this is all the creators behind it. Because I don't want to spoil what happens or how exactly this is happening. Because if it's a King in Black miniseries, and I just told you that all of this takes place during Peter Parker's era of wearing the black alien costume. How is that possible? Because we didn't hear of Null until the pages of Jason Aaron's Thor and then, of course, eventually Venom by Donny Cates. Well, it's done in a unique way, I will say that, and really enjoyed it, and I like the way that it's wrapped up, leaving it so you, you're like, oh, yes, this actually happened. This is part of history. Uh, by the way, the book retails for $15.99. So this is the type of artwork you're going to be seeing in here. It features Kang the Conqueror. It features, uh, there's a couple other surprises I'll, I'll leave in here, uh, but it features the Watcher. Uh, it features the Black Knight, which I'm sure you saw here. And then you have this creature right there. Uh, it spoils that it also has the Rocket Raccoon. But I promise there's a couple more surprises in there. So this dark creature comes here to Earth, recognizes Peter Parker in his black costume, and he's like, brother, how have you been? And Peter Parker's like, whoa, what are you talking about? And from there, it's just mishap after mishap. And of course, this creature here needs somebody to have symbiosis with. So you can find out who that somebody is later on. But I thought it was done in a really good, slick kind of way that doesn't really interfere with the past. So yeah, there's a team up with Rocket Raccoon and Kang the Conqueror. Man, this gets good. This is, this is a solid story. I've really enjoyed this. And it kind of makes me wish that Peter David would go back and just make this, or, or, or at least Marvel Greenlight, a ongoing series featuring this era of Spider-Man. I'd love to see all this stuff just collected in one big oversized hardcover format. And I hope this isn't the last of the symbiote Spider-Man. 
uh, mini series that we're going to see. I hope for every event we have this, but what I really want is, of course, an ongoing series. So there's Kang the Conqueror. Let's look at some of the extras, because some of the extras are really cool, some of the variants that they have. And for those of you asking the same questions that I was, how is this possible? How are they going to resolve all this? I promise, no stone is left on turn. It's Peter David we're talking about. So here's some of the variants. And some of the sketches here for the covers. It's beautiful. And of course, the advertisements for the other two Symbiote Spider-Man books. And here's that moment for all you spine watchers. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, ring that bell for notifications, check out our Patreon and our spread shop if you can do so. Great ways to support the channel. All right, let's continue. Now, before we start looking at this book, I do have to make a disclaimer that this is my original copy of Dawn's Early Light, the very first printing that came out, oh my gosh, I think 2014. It's an old book. Um, so Marvel didn't send me a new printing of this to do a comparison. So what we're looking at here is mainly the artwork. Ignore all this because we've had a lot more Epic Collections since then. Uh, the paper quality, I'm sure, is different now, so it's probably not going to be as thick. But we're mainly looking at the artwork and just talking a little bit about the story and what makes this particular epic collection stand out above the rest. And I'm sure you can probably tell at first glance that is because of John Byrne, but also because of Roger Stern. And while their run was really brief, and I mean really brief, um, they left an impact on this book. I mean, Roger Stern introduced the character of Bernie, who plays a big role later on in Captain America's love life. Uh, so this collects Captain America 247 to 266 and annual number five. So this is a pretty interesting story because to me, this feels like it ties into so many of John Byrne's other stories, mainly because of the things that he draws in the background. And if you've read this, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say uh, Doctor Doom from Fantastic Four or... Acts of Vengeance, just throwing that out there. Uh, but this particular story, I remember in the background as a kid, mapping it with the other stories that John Byrne was writing. And I thought it was a genius. So the big book here, though, is this particular book right there. The Captain America for President story alone is worth it. It is so good, so ahead of its time. And I'm not saying that anything that came before this was ridiculous or anything, but to me, it just felt so ahead of its time. Um, the, the whole Roger Stern run did, honestly, with uh, Cap uh, with Captain America, with John Byrne. Because like their run only lasted from 247, I think up to 255 was the final issue that they did together. And... Everybody talked about this run. Like when I was getting in the comics and I was only reading X-Men, uh, people would tell me to go check out Roger Stern's Captain America run. And eventually I did. Yeah, I ended up getting the single issues. I had the War and Remembrance trade paperback signed by Uncle Raj uh, for a long time. And then I upgraded to the Epic Collection when this came out. But oh, they, uh, one other thing that they do is they clarify Captain America, Steve Rogers' origin through these pages. There was a lot of... Just, uh, how do I put it, convoluted things that previous writers were doing with Captain America. And this kind of sets the bar anew with his true origin story. This is a good story, too. This is the one where he teams up with Union Jack. So he sees Union Jack again, and they fight Baron Blood. This is a classic storyline. And we're introduced to a new Union Jack. It has a actually it has a pretty sad story or ending at the end. Now they were supposed to uh, have done another issue, like there was a script for another issue, and unfortunately, just they. I don't even know what happened. I don't know if Uncle Raj left out of his uh, will or if he was told to leave. Uh, but it doesn't feel like it because if there's a couple of fill-in writers that come in, such as Chris Claremont, uh, David Michelinie step in to do some of the fill-in art. Or I'm um, writing. But then eventually, the other big thing about this particular epic collection is that this is the early stages of Mike Zek coming into Captain America. And Zek's artwork is so good. Very reminiscent of what John Byrne was doing. Didn't flow as well as John's artwork, but you can tell that he was heavily inspired 
by him. And this is just the beginning. I mean, this is before the Deathlock miniseries, which is freaking stunning. Uh, hope one day that stuff gets collected in some kind of oversized format. But, you know, it's just he's a solid storyteller. And the other person joining him is J.M. DeMatteis, who takes over the Captain America book eventually. So after a bunch of little fill-ins, J.M. DeMatteis and Mike Zek take over the Captain America book. Um, there's some also fill-in artists here like Gene Colan, the phenomenal legendary Gene Colan. And honestly, all his stories do fit the tone of his artwork. So they're kind of almost borderline horror stories. But this is what... There's Zek. This is the Mike Zek stuff I'm really familiar with. Um, but it's interesting to see him draw some of the stuff here that just doesn't feel like Mike Zek. Because they're so like the characters are so stiff, nothing really is moving fluid like I'm used to. This is this is uh, Alan Cooperberg. I think it's a fill-in issue. As far as the extras, though, what we have here in the back, so we have this article from Captain America Remember from 2007. Uh, the book, by the way, has 496 pages. And yes, here is the trade paperback that I had that featured the unused artwork by John Byrne. How Captain America came back from, uh, from the UK to the United States and apparently uh, had the return of some of his other arch nemesis. And that was all. That was all that John Byrne got the draw. It wasn't inked, it was just penciled, and they put it together for this particular trade paperback that came out in 1990. It's another John Byrne unused story, like the Fantastic Four. Uh, oh, uh, articles again. A introduction from Roger Stern from the original printing of War and Remembrance, and then original artwork. And I'm sure the back of the new printing will be filled with other epic collections you can find. Let's keep going. With one of my most anticipated books for the month of July, and that is Wolverine Epic Collection Blood and Claws, or Volume 3 of the Epic Collections. From the years 1990 to 1991, my favorite standalone Wolverine story of all time is in here. Some of my favorite Wolverine stories are here. So this collects issues 31 through 44 of Wolverine, the 1988 series that Chris Claremont and Big John Buscema started, Wolverine Bloodlust, that's the Alan Davis uh, graphic novel, as well as Bloody Choices, that's the one by Tom DeFalco and John Buscema. So what, what makes this so unique? What makes this stand out to me? Yeah, honestly, it's probably the impact that it had in my life. 1990, 1991, I was in middle school and... This was just the most amazing thing. Wolverine was on his own, but, you know, in the pages of X-Men, he was being reunited with the X-Men later on. But we'll talk about what made this stand out, and that is two things. I guess, no, really three. So let's talk about the three things that made this stand out. Larry Hama, Mark Silvestri, Dan Green. All three of them taking over Wolverine. Larry Hama coming in, and I knew, you know, I had read issues of G.I. Joe, but I was like, Larry Hama writing Wolverine? Huh? Well, we'll see what happens. And I think the only other thing I remember about Larry Hama during the time besides writing G.I. Joe was that he was an actor and a musician because they did a spotlight on him on some Marvel H books and they talked about how he was in an episode of MASH and he was writing Wolverine. Sure, whatever, we'll see. I mean, you know, we've had fill-in writers all the... Like, we had John Byrne for a while, we had Archie Goodwin and from the get-go, he kicked all kinds of ass. Throw in Mark Silvestri, who was my favorite artist at the time. And, you know, he left X-Men to do Wolverine. Oh, my gosh. And they Dan Green finishing his art or inking a lot of it. Just giving it this almost John Buscema style. Oh, I love this stuff. So the first arc is all about the Yakuza, Wolverine fighting them. And it's a freaking stellar story. Then the ball gets rolling after that. Because there's a standalone story in here. Uh, after issue 33. And that is this one here. The Hunter in the Darkness. My favorite Wolverine story. All it is. It's just a couple of uh, police officers. Are hunting down this guy that kidnapped a woman. And one of them seems to recognize Wolverine maybe. And oh. So good. I mean, meanwhile there's this creature out there. That is might. Maybe not involved. And then, of course, Logan gets involved. 
So, to me, I think this is the perfect Wolverine story. It has a interesting beginning, you know, and then you have this really powerful ending that hit me as a kid. I was like, oh my god, what does that mean? What does that mean for the character of Wolverine? This is long before we had all the theories and all these sadly overused tropes about Wolverine. But that to me stood out. It's the first time I remember thinking a particular thing about him. And if you've not read it, I'm not going to spoil it. Here we have the Bloodlust storyline. And this one is kind of... This one is rough. I remember reading this as, as a kid. Uh, there's a lot of violence. There's death of innocence in here. And then Wolverine trying to stop and kind of be the middle ground of these creatures that are out. Uh, these people that are hunting them. And, yes, there's a lot more mystical things in here. And it's Alan Davis and Paul Neary, actually. I think both of them wrote it and uh, were the artists on this. But this is where it's put right after issue 34. I think it's a good placement for it. I say, like, I work for the Collected Editions Department. And here we have Blood and Claws. Oh, dude. this I could talk about this stupid book uh, like just for an hour. So this right here is time travel. Lady Deathstrike. The... Some of the Reavers, Puck, Wolverine, and the biggest selling point to me, Ernest Hemingway. That's all I will say. And, of course, the artwork. But this, ah, oh, this is so good. Then towards the end of this run, we're introduced to two new characters that play a big role in Larry Hama's Wolverine's era. And that is Albert and LCD. There's a fill-in uh, issue with... I think it, no, no, it's not a fill-in issue. It's just an, an issue, um, part of the story, where there's a zookeeper that's going around torturing animals. Logan ain't going to stand for that. And I remember this, uh, because this is pretty unique to see Storm look like this outside of the X-Men, because she didn't keep that haircut for a long time. This is after Extinction Agenda, and right before the X-Men take off to space, and before the X-Men Gold and Blue era. So you didn't see Storm appear like that with her short uh, hair for a while. But she does come in and help with... Oh, LCD is so adorable. And then that... I swear the ball gets rolling because one story leads into the other because the next story arc is, of course, the return of Sabretooth. Now, Sabretooth had been just lying in the sewers here, the Morlock tunnels, right after Caliban broke his back. What was that? New Mutants 91, 92? No, not 92 was the fill-in issue. But anyway, uh, so that's what brings Cable down here. Now, this also reintroduces the whole mystery of, is Wolverine related to Sabretooth? And if so, how are they related? So you get the first appearance of Cable. This cover right here is from issue 41, except the title had to be moved because I remember Wolverine being behind Cable. This thing was so hard to find, issue 41, I couldn't find it. I had to settle for a second printing. Like, who the heck has a second printing of Wolverine 41? And 42 had a second printing as well. So it's the big fight with Sabretooth. We hadn't seen Sabretooth for a little while with Wolverine. And now they're back together fighting. And there's LCD. Adorable. Let's keep going. Okay, here is the fill-in issue. This is the one by Peter David and Larry Stroman. So right before they started working together in the pages of X-Factor, they did this actually really cool story featuring Wolverine on a cruise and, of course, a big creature. Man. You know my boy Larry Hammer, he loves drawing that cake, boy. All right, let's keep going with, I think the last thing collected in here is, yes, Bloody Choices. Now this brings back big John Buscema, who helped kick off Wolverine. And he's teamed up with Tom DeFalco for this particular story. That was, I think the format was a little bit bigger. That's why you see the artwork like this. And it's hard to reproduce artwork like this on this, um, in this trim size mainly because you're going to lose some artwork if you decide to keep going bigger. So they had to shrink it down a little bit. So the only thing I will say about this is that this might be a little bit harder to read for some people. The dialogue boxes and the caption boxes are a little bit harder to read. But there was really is no way to put this on this trim size paper without shrinking it down. Otherwise, it would, you would lose some of the artwork. And I'd rather be smaller than lose some of the artwork. But that's just my opinion. But this is what the art looks like. It's good to see um, Big John come back. And it's funny because he hated superheroes. Like, it wasn't until I started reading Conan by Roy Thomas that I found out that John Buscema hated drawing superheroes. Loved doing Conan. And he was so damn good at it, though. 
and this is Gregory Wright, I think, doing the colors for this particular story. His colors always stand out, so I want to say it's him. Let's see. Yeah, Gregory Wright. No, he was color assist. Oh, maybe he was color assist to Big John. Uh, but that's it. Let's let's look at the extras in the back. So you have a picture here from Wills Portacio. I'm sure there's a couple pinups. Uh, this has to be from the swimsuit issue, the parody stuff. Kevin Nolan right there. Wizard Magazine, Marvel Fanfare pinups, and then original, oh man, original artwork from Sylvester. And yes, Jubilee does play a big role in all this because this is right before and right after they are reunited with the X-Men in Extinction Agenda. Covers to some collections from the past. And wait, yeah, this is what the second printing looked like. That's what I had to settle for. I did find a 42. Then eventually I did find a 41 first printing, but... And then more collections here in the back. Cannot wait. Hopefully one day this will be in omnibus format. But until then, this is nice. Uh, the book retails for $39.99 and has 456 pages. And that, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online source for collected editions up to 50% off. Retail price, Cheap Graphic Novels prides itself on excellent packaging, so your stuff gets to you in excellent condition, and they have amazing customer service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And for all you minties that are watching, if you're a first-time customer, don't forget to mention that Near Mint Condition sent you their way for a promotional credit on free shipping on your next order. Now, this is only for U.S. customers. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your source for the hottest books with deep discounts, customer service, and excellent shipping that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content and page count of each of these trades. Let me know in the comments down below which ones you're picking up. If you missed out on the Captain America Dawn's Early Light first printing and this is your chance to get it, if you're anticipating the Wolverine Blood and Claws epic collection, or if you've been following the King in Black and trade paperback format and what you thought of Ta-Nehisi Coates' run on Black Panther. If you have any questions, please leave those questions down below. Don't forget to hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. We are on Patreon and on Spreadshop. Amazing ways to support the channel if you can do so. More importantly, everyone, stay healthy, stay safe, and much love.